time in market risk. I'm a group manager. I work for a legacy bank. I personally do hold SoFi 60% of my portfolio right now. SoFi is going against giants. You're not going to have an easy path. You're not going to go down without a fight. There's a lot of stuff that goes on the background that people don't necessarily see. I am a firm believer that the world we live in is not all rainbows and sunshines. Very few of them are going to have, you know, true, honest research. They just want to value it as a bank because it's more beneficial for them to value it as a bank. You know, legacy banks don't really have the best tech stack behind them. If they come out and say, hey, we have a deal with City, that there is also a acceptance on City side that their tech sucks. I don't want to say, you know, institutions are manipulating. I never want to lean towards that. But I can say, like, interests are aligned out there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SoFi Weekly. Biden student loans. Are you guys worried? Uh, he's talking about cutting, you know, ton of loans that might even affect up to 30 million students. A lot of these are people that have been paying for a while. It's not guaranteed. We've seen that this is a, a battle as well, you know, politically somewhat, uh, but uh, in the courts as well. So those that are will just have the, the loans that they've issued just be forgiven. You know, they, they're not always happy and thrilled with that. So time will tell. But, you know, large, largely this is a uh, political lever that can be pushed to uh, get a few more votes. So I think that's mostly what it is. We'll have to see. I was actually surprised as many uh, went through as previously as before. So, but, you know, as far as student loans, I know we'll have our predictions a little bit closer to earnings time. Uh, I'm not expecting much from that segment really until we get to the third quarter. Uh, we might, I think we'll start to see that ramping up. And then the fourth quarter, we're going to see a lot of that as some of those penalties really start hitting. Uh, but for now, it's tough. It, it, it really, uh, interest rates need to start getting cut to for that segment to grow. So far, I'll do fine if interest rates aren't cut. But uh, yeah, I mean, who wants to refinance <laughs> at the current interest rates? I, a few people, but uh, most people won't be helped by it necessarily. So the the people with the 780 plus FICOs and 170,000 plus uh, income doesn't really fall under a lot of the stipulations that Biden had laid out. And so I really don't think that this is the same demographic that uh, Biden is talking about, right? These are people that really need the, the cuts versus the people who would really prefer the cuts, which is more leaning on the side of uh, SoFi's demographic. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it really matters. Like they did this in the midterm. They're running the same playbook now. And we know what happened after the midterm. Nothing happened. It got shot down. Don't hold your breath. Don't get your hopes up because this is not something that the president has in his sole discretion to forgive. He needs a whole bunch of hoops to jump through in terms of approvals. This is just a promise. It's a very well-timed promise. The main negative for SoFi the first time around was a moratorium, which is not on the table to be coming back. Student loan forgiveness doesn't apply to SoFi's core ideal customer profile, their core demographic. It's more affluent, higher earners. They wouldn't even fall under that loan forgiveness, regardless of what Kamala Harris says, that they're going to forgive literally everybody, regardless of income. I don't think that's a very feasible plan. So anyways, it's pretty much just lip service, in my opinion. SoFi has had a track record going into earnings of potentially beating the stock moving uh, double digits in percentages, potentially a short period of time, usually one day or potentially one week. Is this something that you guys think is a potential trade for yourselves? My plan, if we go to $10 plus for this earnings, I'm probably going to cut some of the January 2025 leaps because we've just been sort of going horizontal for such a long time in the $7 range for a couple of months now. And so the, the decay on those is getting ugly. I'm either going to take the proceeds from that and buy 2026 sleeps or buy underlying shares at whatever the price is, you know, $10, $9 doesn't really matter. Uh, depending on the strike price, I'm probably going to reduce my risk in those leaps. And I'm still going to keep the 2026s on. Kind of similar. I, with the 2025s, we're not quite there yet, but I, I start to look at rolling those out further. Uh, if they've not done what I wanted, I've already sold uh, in the past leaps that I bought them back again. So I think that my initial outlay is covered, but no, if we run up again, I'm going to look for an opportunity, just like Tevis uh, had said, to either buy the underlying stock. I'll probably do cash secure puts. And if they don't land, like I expect, as we fall back down, I'll Either I'll probably shift some into 2026 leaps or just shares. The money's all going to go back into SoFi one way or another. The other thing that I'm doing as well, and I, I it's it's a gamble. 
made a short term bet. And so I, I have June uh, for $10 strikes and I, I have like, I don't know, 25 call options. So nothing too serious. And I'll take them off the table if they don't end up running and I'll lose a little bit of money. That's fine. Uh, but no, if, if we fly up after earnings, like I expect, I'll take some money uh, from that and I'll buy more SoFi. So, but it's just, it's trading SoFi for SoFi. You know, even people that don't follow it very closely um, just know this repeated pattern that's lasted a few years now where it pops up because it is a, a triple beat again. And then the stock comes back down. One of these days, the pattern will break. It could even be this earnings. The more that it repeats in that range, the harder it is to break out of it because you have the psychology working against you. When it does break 10 or, or I think the high is like 11.7, something like that, people will start piling in, the algorithms will pick it up and it has a potential to go much higher. But that's the critical point where you have all of that selling pressure when you hit 10 because everybody has seen the pattern play out four times successfully now that it hits 10 and it goes back to seven. And so they're going to be immediately putting in sell orders, putting that downward pressure on the stock. So you need something really, really strong to help it reach that escape velocity out of that range. SoFi doesn't have a significant amount of institutional ownership. It's when the institutions are like, hey, this is it, we're buying. And it's it's whatever SoFi does that impresses institutions enough where they start coming in in droves. And I think we're not too far away from that point as a business. That's when it will break the pattern, absolutely. Um, SoFi will get treated differently because there will be new institutions that have uh, that availability of buying them. A lot of the information that we collected about the convertible notes and understanding that offering actually came from uh, a few very smart sources. This was one of them. Everyone, welcome, Martin. For context, uh, when the senior convertible note the news broke. Martin, who works in the banking space, helped us break it down more in just our private SoFi chats. And so everybody in the sort of SoFi analysis community, Chris Hager, Vadim, all these guys, you know, Martin was in that group with us helping make sense of that news, which led to the video that I made that, you know, the whiteboarding video, he was helping us digest the fine print on the details on the convertible note offering came out a couple of days later. Am I able to ask what you do for a job? What industry you're in? I'm in finance. I'm in market risk. I'm a group manager. I work for a legacy bank. My education was also evolved around finance. I personally do hold a uh, SoFi. Um, I was introduced to it by Tev a while ago, uh, about a year and a half ago. And I started, you know, reading more and more about it. And, you know, working for a legacy bank, you also start um, seeing some things that work better, things that could be improved. And, you know, being of a younger generation, I can't tell you how many times I've been at a branch. So, you know, those were small things that got me into reading more and more about SoFi. And, you know, I just love the whole uh, fintech side of it. So the management team has also done tremendously in the last two, three years, this environment has not been great to say the least and for them to every single time beat expectations stay calm have the ability to shift from one business to another depending on the, the macro environment is just phenomenal so you mentioned you know interest in the tech platform why do you think it is that uh, so many that are as far as analysts and everything are looking at the company and just overlooking the tech platform for the most part we've seen a little bit of shift and what would you guess it would actually take to kind of shift that perspective. The problem I have with a lot of analysts is they're very short-sighted. First on their ratings, their ratings are usually for a 12-month period. They're not going to talk to give you ratings on what's going to happen in the next three, five years. Also, another thing is I don't see SoFi rating other banks or other institutions. SoFi is going against giants. You're not going to have an easy path. You're not going to go down without a fight. There's a lot of stuff that goes on the background that people don't necessarily see. I am a firm believer that the world we live in is not all rainbows and sunshine. In terms of the tech platform, analysts are very one-sided, so very few of them are going to have, you know, true, honest research. You know, legacy banks don't really have the best tech stack behind them. Probably one of the reasons why SoFi hasn't really announced anything yet is simply because if they come out and say, hey, we have a deal with Citi, that that is also a acceptance on Citi side that their tech sucks. So it gets ball rolling from there. They just want to value it as a bank because it's more beneficial for them to value it as a bank. Uh, the tech platform, I think, is going to be a giant beast 
um, in the next couple of years. I still see a lot of questions come up regarding convertible note offering and whether or not them getting rid of the preferred shares and some of the higher cost debt that they had. Do you think that this will actually bring more EPS to the bottom line? And, and how does the dilution play into that? For the dilution piece, if them having more capital on hand and having more flexibility leads to more improvement in the business, and then all of a sudden that dilution through some math calculation would happen to be around $16, $17 and so on, because that's why they had those uh, call options to protect themselves up from the dilution up until that point. But you know, if you have a stock price of 30, 40, I mean, we're talking 5X from here, would you really care? For context, why this is still relevant and important is because all of these analyst upgrades are all quoting the convertible notes as the catalyst for their upgrade. They're saying, we looked at SOFA in January and we looked at SOFA today, the balance sheet health is considerably better because they have lower amounts of debt. And as a result of that, they're going to be retaining more of their capital. Their capital ratios are also increasing quite significantly. And that's why they're raising their price targets. And they're all just dominoing in one by one, starting last week, even this week with Deutsche and City, and probably next week as well, as we head into earnings, all because of this deal that Noto did. So it's still very much relevant because everybody is expecting to see the benefits from this. At the same time, though, like from these analyst ratings, I think one of them upgraded from like mid sevens or eights to like 12 with a hold. I mean, how is a 50% upside from here? A hold and not a buy. Just seeing that, I don't even care to read what their reasoning is. And then so five stock price goes up to 15, 16, and then you'll see upgrades of prices to like 20. Similar thing happened with Palantir, Robinhood, other stocks out there that, you know, have, you know, big spikes in, in prices in a short time. Like even Dan Dolev, like he lowered from 15 to 12, I wouldn't be surprised in six months if he goes to 15, 16 again. Just take those price targets as a very short term because there are clients they are sending these ratings to and they're in the business to make money. And usually for big institutions, making money is not five-year terms, 10-year terms. It's usually very quick turnovers. They have to, you know, keep reiterating, re-giving research to their clients. And that's how can, they can keep them locked. That's how they can get their money. So would you say these analyst price targets are an attack on SoFi or just sort of misinformed in that they're making short-term bets? If SoFi was for whatever reason, $13 today, you'd have the same news, same everything. You'd have the price targets of the same analyst at about $17, $18. Whereas if you have an analyst where the price right now is at $750 and they give all of a sudden $20 price target, their managers are going to come out and say, are you insane? Like you're talking about 150%. Something must be wrong in your analysis. Right. Whereas when you're talking about 50% upside potential, it's a lot different. It's a lot more reasonable. People will take it a lot more seriously. That's why I'm saying like as stock price moves in time, they just play catch ball and they just bring out new reiterations, new ratings, just to, you know, be more reasonable in that aspect. Some of them really do point out real risks that everyone should consider, absolutely. But some of them are just ridiculous. Like, you know, the $3 price targets, like you don't even consider the tech piece. You're just a joke of an analyst at that point. How can I take you seriously? Your average return is negative 30%. And now all of a sudden you're going to be the genius to call this like massive short. But, and remember, so far is a real bank. They're getting audited in and out. Internal audits, you have external audits. I cannot stress enough how stringent those are. At our bank, we get all sorts of questions and they'll dive deep into every single thing they can. So the fact that SoFi is getting audited both internally and externally and getting signed off on those audits. And these are big institutions that are providing those sign offs. We're talking about Deloitte. We're talking about, you know, big fours. They're not just going to mess around with SoFi financial statements and just, you know, sign off for no reason. So that gives a sense of comfort and of safety with SoFi. And I feel like some analysts or some people are just banging on the idea that is it possible that the small company has performed so greatly in three years, it must either be a scam or they must be messing up something on their financial statements. And that I firmly do not believe. There's no chance I could give this the stock like a three dollar price target like it's it's just a joke the short volume that we're seeing this the short interest this is insane what we're seeing at at highs of 23 percent. i think it's currently 17 percent short interest what are institutions doing here what, what what's the play that's going on it, from your perspective i don't want to say you know institutions are manipulating i never want to 
lean towards that. But I can say like interests are aligned out there. Institutions working with hedge funds and mutual funds and, you know, big clients, 17% to me, it's whatever. Like you've had Tesla with higher percentages. You have these stocks. I don't really tend to place too much emphasis or importance on those numbers. Also, to me, it's kind of stupid shorting 20 over 20% at a current stock price of $7. Like you're almost saying this company is going to fail. And for the reasons I explained earlier, I don't think that's going to happen. Seeing some some comments that the strong volatility in the short interest could be hedging as a result of the 2029 convertible note deal. Is there anything there maybe to expand on that? Because this went from 23 to 17 in a matter of two weeks, right? And so that's a pretty big fluctuation in such a short period of time in such close proximity to that convertible note offering. Some of the players that, you know, are involved in those uh, convertible notes and that, you know, buy those from SoFi, they might have the interest to short the stock, especially because you're going to get a smaller price when you can convert shares. So you, you effectively get more shares from that note. So that initially is what you saw the, the stock price reaction. Noda also explained it on the on, on Jim Kramer. Um, it also has happened with a lot of companies. It's happened with Uber as well. There is definitely, I think, some sort of strategy behind it. And it also coincides with, you know, the short interest dropping materially these last two weeks without any major news coming out. Can we ask Martin how likely he believes SoFi is an acquisition target, potentially from other large inst or large financial institutions, perhaps? Could be. Probably not right now. Not, I don't think, right now. I also think Noda is going to do anything he can to not be acquired. I don't think he's going for that deal. I think if he was thinking about that, he probably would have thought of an, a, a way out. I mean, stock price has been really compressed. We don't even know if he's going to get you know, his rewards by 2026. If he wanted a way out, he would have found one. And I think he wants SoFi to be um, his legacy, how he is remembered. He kind of strikes me as similar to JP Morgan CEO, where he pretty much built it from ground out. So um, I think SoFi is here to stay. And even if it becomes an acquisition target, I don't think it's coming at a cheap price. Is there anything that you can add from your perspective on a different way of looking at this company or something that potentially you think that we're just completely missing out on any risks associated with SoFi technology? There's definitely risks. The macro environment right now is not ideal. The economy has been handled relatively well, which is the reason why they've kept rates the way they are. And, you know, we went from all of a sudden six rate cuts expected to two or even one this year. There are definitely risks there. I think this year and next year will be relatively tough unless um, things change. It's a situation I don't think we've had before, which makes it really interesting. And SoFi is an interest rate sensitive company. You have the loan book and depending on how rates go in the future, that could really impact how they decide to do originations or uh, package loans and, you know, securitize them and how they're valued. So that's a real risk there. And then their growth these couple of years has been really maintained by the loan origination piece. You have even high FICO score, people start defaulting on those loans, then it becomes a real problem. But the numbers are that the data is not showing that as of yet. So I don't think there's a, a big concern at this moment, but those are real risks to be considered. And at the same time, the biggest risk I think with SoFi is you have have a puppy going against bulldogs. SoFi is coming to eat their dinners. If you had a company that's going for Amazon or is going for Google and they're just such a small company, like think of the probability that happens. So that is something that everybody has to consider. But that's also the same criticism Tesla was getting, Amazon was getting at this time. Yeah, definitely be mindful out there. I think these are the, the biggest risks. You know, I really stand by the morals of SoFi and uh, the management team. So it's something I want to support, something that motivates me personally as well. When those two things match, it's a good enough reason for me to invest in. Once that changes, then obviously I will reallocate. These are the major risks. But again, you're looking at a great management team. You mentioned yeah. Robinhood and Palantir before. I know this is SoFi Weekly. I'm just curious if you're holding those personally or if that's just 
you mentioned them as examples. I just mentioned them as examples. I do look at them uh, closely. I really like uh, Robinhood for their UI platform. They're very user friendly. And I wish SoFi would also do something like that with Invest, but they're two different companies. One thing I didn't really like particularly uh, in the last two weeks was when Robinhood came out with a credit card. Everybody was just jumping out of excitement. Hey, it's 3% here. Why isn't SoFi doing this? They're going for different market shares. And I don't think people People invest in SoFi just particularly for the invest portion of it. I think it's a lot bigger and that invest portion is actually just a small piece. I mean, SoFi is going to be the one-stop shop, so it definitely has to have that in it. But just comparing SoFi and Robinhood, like apples to, it's not apples to apples to me. A lot of companies right now are trying to be the exciting thing in the market. I also saw the Robinhood, you know, 3% credit card. It, it's a great idea, but the math really has to math with it. To me, it's a, it's a make or break. It's a risky option. Offering. I also like to advise people that, you know, when you see hot, interesting news come out, really read into it before getting excited. The first few days you had people talking about Robin Hood. Hey, nobody's matching Robin Hood. Robin Hood was the most talked thing for those two days. And then the third day, the fourth day, people say, hey, but I don't get the full match unless I stay with them five years. Maybe it's not that great of a deal. If it looks too good, it's it probably is too good to be true. There's probably something in it. it it's a great idea, but they really have to hit every point to make it successful. And it's not something that, you know, I would take money out of SoFi to put into Robin Hood because of that 3%. Like, it's not that type of exciting. They didn't invent the flying car or whatever. Thank yeah. You. And then the fact I love more is that Noto didn't go after it. Like a lot of people were saying, hey, Noto, what do you have? He's a smart man. He's not playing cards because people tell into. He's not going to give you a 4% credit card or 5% credit card so he can fight with Robin Hood. He manages his company and the dude stays calm regardless of, you know, what's out there. People like that, managers like that, you know, CEOs like that, they survive. It's it's a long run game. It's it's who stays in longer. It's not who's more exciting in the next month or two. Do you have any yeah. unique you one earnings predictions, Martin? Well, I saw a lot of analysts didn't even put an average of like one cent. And I'm like, okay, guys, like, come on. It's not even like half a cent. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I think it's going to be around one to two cents. Members number is going to be interesting. They signed major deals. NBA deal, I think, is is going to play values as well. We're seeing that logo everywhere. I mean, the NBA is one of the most followed leagues in the U.S. and in the world. And also going for, you know, top sports icon. You have Jason Tatum. You have, uh, I don't watch golf as much, but I saw that they signed a, a big guy on golf. Wyndham well. Clark. Yeah. You have to think about who the target market is for SoFi. They're young. Young people tend to follow these sports and be excited sports about sports. So I think members numbers are, are going to come in good this quarter. We'll see. I, I don't know too much about how the loan piece is going to work. Like I don't they did guide for 92 to 95 percent of what they had before. So Dan Dolov said completely the opposite on his interview. So that was quite interesting to me. Is it just mainly the management is what you're placing bets on? What makes you think that SoFi even has a has a chance? Management, I think, is one of the key piece, pieces why people even invest in stocks. Palantir, people invest because of Alex Carp. You have Tesla, take Elon out now and then see what happens to Tesla stock. You'll have it 50% down tomorrow. Because at the end of the day, they're the people that are making the decisions. They're the people that are driving the company and the stock price follows. They're not per se looking at the, the stock price on a daily basis, not just going to their office and you know banging their heads on the wall and saying, oh, stock's at 7.5. They don't care. Noto knows the legacy world. He was in it. I'm in the legacy world right now. I know it. So he did see things that could have been improved. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do it on my own. He knows how they function. He knows the environment very, very well. And for him to take on this mission, you know, he knows what he's up against. He was top rated at his legacy bank as well. So you're not talking about just, you know, one CEO out of the blue, like this guy is, he's for real. One of the biggest reasons I'm invested in SoFi is because of him. And I know that is another big risk, similar to Tesla, uh, key men risk, you know, take them out of the equation. You have different stories behind and different thesis, which is why you know, you have a lot of FUD around people live, like the president of SoFi Bank, like leaving and, you know, the CRO being replaced and all that stuff. Like people place bets on SoFi because of management, 
more than anything. And once that shifts, then it can change stuff. But yeah, I definitely think management is is the major point here. Chances we touch eleven dollars in May. I'm in just reading May, probably tough. I'd say around nine is what we're looking at right now. Again, remember they're being conservative this year. I do think we do see tens again this year, but I wouldn't expect too too much other than that. Again, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in terms of macro environment. It's not like a lot of the SoFi stock price is not also even related to SoFi. One other thing that I've been noticing, I do say that I don't like to follow the stock price, but as a matter of fact, I do have a bunch of stocks on my computer computer every day that I do see the, the price action on. And one of the things that would piss me most when I was an early investor into SoFi, you know, I was emotional because, hey, I put money into it. I wanted to double in a month. It takes a toll on you. Like SoFi, it, it's not for the week. You need to be really good with your emotions to, to hold this stock. It will go down on a good day and you have all the other banks or all the other tech companies going up and SoFi going down. It, it really makes you question your decision. But honestly, what I've loved with SoFi price action lately is it's not trading the same as a firm or upstart. And you saw firm earnings before or upstart going down 5% and, you know, SoFi would go down 7 or 8 because of something related to them. Now it's completely detached. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if you look at their price action in the last three to four months and saw a very small correlation. That detachment and SoFi getting its own identity is, I think, a shift in sentiment that is going to play volumes moving forward. Last year, you were building a base around 3 $4. Now, you're very solidly staying around seven, seven and a half. It's early, guys. We just had a first quarter of profitability. Like, how exciting is that? You know, give it time. It's a new company. I think in what? a year time, we're going to see very different results. More funds are going to flow money into SoFi because of all their the mandates they have. Some funds are not even allowed to invest in SoFi until they have a full year of profitability or until they're at 10 billion market cap. So for all those reasons, see a volatility in stock price right now. But as they grow, as they show more stability and profitability, I think that whole story is going to change. What uh, percentage of SoFi is Martin holding? 60% of my portfolio right now. Do you only hold common shares? Yes. Unfortunately, I can't play too much with options because in legacy banks, when you're working at certain departments or in any institution, you know, that is dealing with clients, you, there are very strict trading policies. You are supposed to only hold uh, a position for at least 30 days. You're not allowed, you know, very frequent trading. And I wouldn't like to, you know, buy options and not have to make a decision or, or do something with them. Having that trading re restriction, up, unfortunately, is not, it, it's not worth my time right now. So I'm just building a position and holding common shares. I, I don't know if I understood that. Are you saying that um, the bank that you work under is controlling the way that you trade in your personal account? Or are you talking about a corporate account or, or some sort of money that you're managing for clients? It's personal account. So you work for a, a bank, let's say, right? Your whole paycheck and your whole investment accounts need to be with the bank. And in that trading policy, there are there are different time frames where you can trade. So there's certain stocks that you're not even allowed to trade because the bank has ongoing relationships with them. So that's mm -hmm. like a trading restriction, for example. Another trading restriction is they don't want you to be going in and out of trades because during market hours, you're supposed to be doing the job for one and not be trading stocks. They only allow you to uh, buy a stock if you're holding it for 30 days and only in circumstances where the stock price, let's say, drops at 30 or 40 percent. and You just want to take your money out so that you'll have more losses. They do allow you to sell the stock. But other than that, you do have, unfortunately, that 30 day restriction and they do monitor that. Some people also, they have to ask for permission to trade a certain stock before they trade it. It just has to be a verified portfolio. Like it, it can't be, let's say, with um, Quest Trade, let's say. Quest Trade is in one of their like non-verified whatever dealers because their systems are not integrated to the point where have a full view 24-7 of what you do. So every time you trade, you need it to um, get permission. But if your account is with the bank itself, then they have full monitoring on it. And it's very easy for them to raise flags or do anything like that. So for the, for reasons like that, and for the fact that I just uh, want to invest long term, um, I could buy leaps. Uh, I've been thinking about that. I mean, it does fall into things I'm allowed to do essentially. So, but yeah, I personally have just wanted to build my position at these low prices and I've just gone for pure common shares. I'm curious if there's any interesting insight given the background in risk that you can share like i'm sure a lot of people in the chat didn't know about the restrictions that a legacy bank would put on your personal account for you know you have to disclose these trades and 
Honestly, like some of these restrictions, they apply more to certain departments than others. But you have to think like some of these institutions, they only have one HR department or one governance department dealing with seven different subsidiaries of the bank. They don't have enough people or enough time to make the rules different for each separate department. The information I deal on on a day-to-day basis, even for the stocks that they have on their full restricted list, I don't have information for me to go on and make a decision that, hey, this is a buy today. So I mostly deal with risk on the, the bank, on the top of house level, where, you know, products that the bank deals with the clients, you know, how much losses they're exposed to on a daily basis, how much they can lose with, with a certain percentage of confidence in the next week or so, be able to communicate that type of risk to leadership so that they can, you know, place the appropriate limits and the appropriate strategies to the trading desk. So I don't have any information on stocks per se, but I do take care of portfolios that do trade stocks, but not on a proprietary basis. They're mostly trading stocks or holding positions to make a market for clients. So you're like the nerdy analyst from Margin Call. Make sure that the trading guys need to start doing a fire sale. And (laughs) No, I do deal with a lot of numbers on a daily basis. And I can say that 100% of the macro environment is is not as stable because we do get a lot of workload when, you know, the market is volatile. There's certain portfolios that are exposed to more volatility. So yeah, definitely the workload is out there. Whereas in more normal times, it it will be a lot easier. So it's not a great environment. And there's, again, this huge uncertainty on what the what the actions are going to be. It's an election year. You have Biden coming out and saying there's going to be a rate cut. And then for all we know, there should be a complete independence between Fed and the president. So it's like, how is he coming out with these statements? So the market is very, very volatile because it doesn't know what to read from who at this point. And until we get a clear picture, I just like to see it as an opportunity for me to grab cheap shares from companies I like. This has been awesome. Until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching.